Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. This podcast is a production of the online journal Law and Liberty and hosted by our staff. Please visit us at lawliberty.org and thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Brian Smith and with me today is Helen Dale. Helen is a senior writer at Law & Liberty. She won the Miles Franklin Award for her first novel, The Hand That Sound to Paper. She read law at Oxford and Edinburgh. Her most recent novel, which we'll talk about here extensively along with The Hand That Signed the Paper, is Kingdom of the Wicked, which was shortlisted for the Prometheus Prize for Science Fiction. Helen appears in a number of outlets, including The Spectator, The Australian, Standpoint, and Quillette, and has a very active substack. Uh, Thank you for joining me, Helen. Thank you for having me, Brian. Good to be here. So I wanted to start off by talking uh, about Kingdom of the Wicked, uh, which I've read twice and I enjoy very much. And uh, it takes the readers on a sort of strange journey to an alternate history. And uh, I hope uh, you can tell our listeners a bit about the book and what led you to write it. Well, first, it's in two parts. There's two books, but there isn't going to be a third. So all the people who keep trying to say, please write a, uh, make it a trilogy and write a third book of Kingdom of the Wicked, I destined to be disappointed. Once I had finished the second book of Kingdom of the Wicked, um, the, the story is indeed finished, as you can confirm, it comes to a natural end. Mm-hmm. So book one of Kingdom of the Wicked, which came out in 2017, is called Rules. And book two of Kingdom of the Wicked, which came out in 2018, you can tell I wrote them back to back, is called Order. And the Rules and Order is from F.A. Hayek in Law, Legislation and Liberty, because I used a method from Hayek in order to develop the legal system in the books. So what I'm going to do now, and this is very lazy of me, but it always works, is I'm going to read the blurb off the back of book one of Kingdom of the Wicked, which was written by my editor. (laughs) And my, My editor is very good at writing blurbs. I've written three novels and I've not written the blurb for any of them because I'm completely rubbish at this. And if there are any writers listening to this, they would think that I have been extremely lucky because most of the time the poor writer is forced to write the blurb. But my efforts are so pitiful that this has reliably been taken out of my hands by everybody. So I shall read the blurb off book one and you will see where this story is going. 784 Ab Urbe Condita. 31 AD. Jerusalem sits uneasily in a Roman empire that has seen an industrial revolution and now has cable news and flying machines and rights and morals that are strange and repellent to the native people of Judea. A charismatic young leader is arrested after a riot in the temple. He seems to be a man of peace, but among his followers are zealots and dagger men sworn to drive the Romans from the Holy Land. As the city spirals into violence, the stage is set for a legal case that will shape the future, the trial of Yeshua ben Yusuf. Intricately imagined and ferociously executed, Kingdom of the Wicked is a stunning alternative history and a story for our time. Thank you, Matt Rubenstein, my editor, who wrote that. Very good. (laughs) So why'd you write this? Well, after my first, my first novel, The Hand That Signed the Paper, was enormously, enormously successful. It was a massive bestseller and enormously, enormously controversial. And I had signed, like most writers do, uh, with my first book, I had signed what's known as an option clause, which in contract law gives your publisher effectively the right of first refusal on your second book or your next book. In my case, it would have been my second book. And when a book is sold, probably hundreds of thousands of copies by this point, the publisher really does expect you to write another one because you ha- your name has become a license to print money. And I had this idea, I also had this idea in my head that I would be a full-time writer. And remember, I had been admitted to university to study a, a combined qualification This is an Australian thing where you do an arts degree and a law degree at the same time, and it's five or six years long. And you can do this with science or accountancy as well, but I had done it with liberal arts, and my liberal arts was in classics. And so I actually abandoned the law studies at at the time, thinking I was going to be a full-time writer, and I started to write a second novel, which I thought I I would use my classical education ability to read ancient languages 
to write a novel with a Roman Empire setting. And I started to do the research for it and put it together and so on and so forth. And I'd written about 40,000 words and I realised it was just dreadful. It was just unpublishable. I was writing to a contract. I was attempting to force myself to do something when I wasn't ready to write it. I hadn't thought about it for long enough. And I knew it was so bad. It was, and 40,000 words, I'm not a quick writer. 40,000 words represents a year's work, probably, maybe even more. But I feel I have a recollection yeah. of it taking about a year of me being a full-time writer and just all this money piling up and me just trying to be a full-time writer and staring at the walls and trying to write this book. I don't know whether you have this in the United States, but Australia and the UK both have this uh, system whereby the, you get hard waste disposal and the, the local council, local authority sends around notices saying if you've got hard waste that's unsuitable for recycling or for your bins or so on and so forth, you leave it out on the curb on an appointed day and special disposal vehicles will come around and collect it. And it saves you a trip. Yeah, we do. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I admit I got all of the draft of the manuscript, all of my notes, everything, boxed it all up and put it on the footpath with, you know, like a dud TV set and various other things for the council to take it away. <laughs> I just wanted to embalm embalm the entire thing in a giant block of perspex and then fire it out of the solar system. And I then realised that I had made a very foolish decision abandoning the law degree and I had to go back to university to complete the law degree. Um, I did various other things first. I mean, because I'd travelled all around Europe and particularly lived in Italy and things like this, worked in Italy worked on archaeological digs, did all sorts of stuff like that to do the research for the book. And I just had to come back to the university. Some, some de- five, this was like five years later than I should, six years later, it was enormously later than I should have been, where I still had this open enrolment in law. And I, t- I, called the university and I called the law faculty and said, yeah, I was admitted. Da, da, da. And they all knew who I was because I was the Miles Fra- I, The first book won the Miles Franklin Award, which is the Australian equivalent of the Booker Prize or the Pulitzer Prize. It had sold all these copies. It had been very controversial. And I said, oh, well, I think I better come back to law school and do my law degree. <laughs> and, and I remember the secretary in the law department going, did you not come up with an idea for another novel? And I'm going, it's worse than that. I wrote 40,000 words of rubbish and had to throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to pay a fine. It was only $30, but I did have to pay a fine for just like taking years to come back to, 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 to start and then complete the law degree. And after that, I just did what lawyers do. I did my law qualifications, about another three years of study I had to do, and I just went into practice. Um, I did pupillage, I was at the bar, and then uh, I did very well at university and was kind of a bit of a star. And so I came and did my postgraduate qualifications in the law of England and Wales. I did what's known as the BCL at Oxford, or I was at Brasenose College. And then because I got a job in Scotland, I did the Scots Law qualifications at the University of Edinburgh while I was in practice up there for several years. And the thing is, the idea of a book set in ancient Rome never really went away. The whole time I was working all these years, I was just working in various law jobs or studying or but or, or doing both at the same time. And I thought I would really like to write this book. Um, that would be, I think I can write a good book. And I had written one short story for a magazine back in the 90s where I had specifically focused on the scene of how would a modern society respond to a Jesus Christ-like figure and what would the execution look like. And I uh, about two paragraphs of that short story actually finished up in Kingdom of the Wicked, in book two of Kingdom of the Wicked, and it had, I mean, I built built it up very differently because there's a, there's a sting in the tail with I'm quite good at plotting. I've always liked crime fiction and I know how it works, police procedurals, that kind of thing because I've been a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I, I did that and that culminated in an execution by firing squad. And, and it looked very South American, you know, the Cordillo and, and that kind of thing. And But I left it. That short story came out in like 1998 or something, but I then just left it. And 
I was becoming sort of more economically successful as a lawyer and I had more experience and more knowledge to draw on and so on and so forth. So I gradually started to put together a kingdom of the wicked. And I returned to that original short story that came out in the 90s and thought, my goodness, it's not just a case of how would we respond to someone like this. And there are all various films that or musicals that try to deal with this Jesus Christ superstar and Jesus of Montreal and, and that kind of thing. But I then started, the thing that was always important to me with background in classics was the Romans were really different from us. And the thing, the thing is they look superficially like us. They look liberal because they have a republic, because they have the secret ballot, uh, because they have constituencies, uh, they, because they have, uh, for, if you're British, they have a constitution ordered by constitutional conventions. Yeah, this is the sort of before the republic t- turns right. to rot, you know, that, the, late, the Roman, Roman Republic. They also, I mean, they have women with unusually high status. You've even got at local authority level, you've got some women voting. You've got a society that starts to look in terms of its social progress and social order and fluidity, the ability to move between classes. It looks like the 18th and the 19th century in the UK, in England and Scotland. Remembering, of course, that Scotland a big part of the Scottish Enlightenment was people like Adam Smith and David Hume drawing on Roman law, which is very distinctively used as part of the Scottish legal system, in which I'm qualified and experienced and worked as a solicitor in Scotland, which is what um, British people call an attorney, whereas a barrister in Scotland is called an advocate, and that's the, what they were in ancient Rome, they were advocatus for a boy and advocata for a girl, mm. as it's Latin and it's gendered and all the Romance languages have gender. Grammatical, a grammatic, grammatical and natural gender in that case. But the thing is, so you get this superficial similarity with the Romans because of this constitutionalism, because of things that, you know, that are very important in the American, in American history. I mean, you read you, Liberty Fund at some point sent me as a Christmas present a, a complete edition of the Federalist Papers. Oh, there it is there, the yep. Federalist <laughs> up on the wall there, which I then read. And I'd never read it before because I'm coming out of the British tradition, so I'm familiar, familiar with all of ours, with Dicey and, and, ba- and Badgett and all of the people that are, that are our traditions or, you know, Alfred Deacon in Australia, the Tenterfield orations, all of the things that feed into Britain and Commonwealth. So, and I'm just sort of sitting here thinking I had a lot of respect for the people who wrote The Federalists, but they had clearly done the same thing that, that a lot of baby classicists do, of reading the ancient civilization and thinking, oh, they're just like us. Yeah, and, that, and like they us. really do, yeah. And they really do. And I'm not blaming those American statesmen for doing that. I'm not blaming your founders for doing that because, I mean, you, you get more awareness that they were different when you start really reading the debates of the framers, as they're called in Australia, but the framers were having all their constitutional debates leading up to the Australian constitution being drafted and then enacted in 1901 with Federation. Their first big constitutional convention was in 1890. So it's way, way later than the Americans. There have been huge amounts more research into what sort of society the Romans were. And so you have to not see them, despite the superficial similarity, as 19th century or 18th century liberals. Yeah. And when they do things like that sound like liberals, so... For example, I'll give you a late pagan writer. When he's being critical of Christianity, he's a pagan and he's criticising the Christians around him. His name is Symmachus and he's a senator. And he argues very beautifully and movingly, it's a beautiful speech, where he says, truth is the light on the hill and all the religions are different paths up the hill, but they'll all get to the truth eventually. That sounds like, you can imagine someone like Milton writing that, or Locke. Mm -hmm. But the reason he made that argument is not because he's a liberal. He he drew that argument from hermeticism. So this is part of the corpus hermeticus or hermeticum, which was the basis of Gnosticism and esoteric magic, where the argument was that people were making when they were putting the corpus hermeticum together in the 
in between the first century BC and the third century AD is that anyone can do this kind of magic. It doesn't matter what religion they are. Oh. Okay. And what makes you special is not the religious belief or your lack of it. What makes you special and powerful and interesting is your ability to do this special kind of magic. So access to the secret knowledge. Access to the secret knowledge. You know, the ability to see invisible systems, you know, that kind of thing. So Simicus is always read as a liberal by people unless you have an awareness of ancient religion. That's just one tiny example. There are other things that are pervasive all through the Roman legal system. Whilst the Romans did not believe that slaves were inferior forms of the human, slavery was contrary to natural law in the Roman world, the Roman conception of natural law was nothing like what natural law is to modern people or to even practitioners in the United States. There aren't really many natural lawyers in the UK. We tend to be legal positivists. You know, law comes from the state, basically, right. and it doesn't pre-exist the state. But we know what natural law is. We're all taught of it at university and how it has religious roots and so on and so forth. Natural law to a Roman meant a combination of everything in its right place or what you see around you in the natural environment. It was a blend of those two. So it's Darwin before Darwin, which is why when you read someone like Lucretius, it sounds very Darwinian. It sounds like natural selection. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of thinking. And so that sent me off on a few different paths, but the big things I felt I had to bring out, and I would be very interested uh, because you've mentioned to me just in private chat before this uh, when we've been at Liberty Fund conferences, there are certain things that really leapt out at you about the Roman characters in my books and their attitudes. But the thing I had to bring out most strongly to a modern reader was that these people did not believe that anyone was morally equal, that people were morally equal. They also thought that if you had a special gift, and they tended to divide to divide the gifts up into blocks of three, so you get the ritualistic three thumps of European folklore, which is just pervasive. And the, the, the three traits were beauty, intellect, and courage. These were the three prize traits. This also existed in Greek society, and I will use the Greek heroes, heroines for this one, because they're they're more familiar than the Roman ones. So beauty, Helen. Never mind that Helen's an extremely dodgy person throughout the Homeric stories and is basically (laughs) an infomaniac. Yes. Okay? But she is blessed. She is blessed. She has this gift of beauty. Cleverness can be male or female. More strongly so with the Romans, they didn't have a problem with clever women. Women had high status in their society. But the Greek characters, the boy, Odysseus, mm-hmm. who's a massive sneak, yeah. he goes around I mean, behind again. everybody, everybody's back. Again, again, not a nice guy. Not a nice guy. And then the other one, the female, Penelope, mm-hmm. who leads all those suitors up the garden path and then gets them all killed and all their <laughs> servants killed. And their servants weren't exactly in on the attempt to try and raise her off, but they all get killed too. And then courage, courageousness, for which the model is Achilles. He's a boy for that one. So you get intelligence they recognise can be either sex. The others tend to be gendered. And then you get Achilles, and it's very clear all the way through that Achilles is, as the British say, a massive bell end. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> not a good person. And it's because the thing is these civilizations didn't work on a good and evil polarity. To be strong was to be good. To be weak was to be evil. To be a loser was to be evil. So you could get the radical things that sound quite radical. Slaves are fully formed humans. If you were a Roman citizen of either sex and you particularly fancied one of your slaves, and this is this there is an element of mutuality in this, obviously. Um, as opposed to just sexual exploitation, then the, and you wanted to marry them. Well, you couldn't marry a slave because slaves didn't have capacity, lawyer capacity, contractual capacity. They couldn't make a will. They couldn't enter a contract. They couldn't do all the things that a citizen could do, or even non-citizens to a degree. But in this case, it's particularly important in the context of Roman citizens. So you had to go through a manumission ceremony and free the slave and then go through multiple other steps So that the slave, particularly if the slave in question was female, uh, to make sure that she became a citizen because Romans, like Jews, inherited their status 
um, from, the from the mother. Okay, so I mean, all my all any Jewish people listening to this now can then go, oh, halakhically Roman, that's interesting, and have a little giggle because <laughs> it works the same way. <laughs> Yeah. So, oh, and, and I have to interject. So Helen has a great short story, the name of which I cannot remember. I think that, it's just called uh, Angel and Monica, the ca- name of yes. the characters. And it's from, it's from Shapers of Worlds, Volume 2, which is edited by a Canadian science fiction author called Edward Willett. Shapers of Worlds, Volume 2. Edward Willett is the author, W-I-L-L-E-T-T. And it is a piece of Kingdom of the Wicked that finished up on the cutting room floor. And I was really upset when it was removed and I kept it. So when a a science fiction publisher and writer came along to me and said, I'm putting together a collection, can you contribute an an original short story to it? I did. They got Angela and Monica from Kingdom of the Wicked that I was forced to lead out. (laughs) And it has a wonderful account of uh, exactly what you just described. Yes. Um, And I I, I think for my part, the, the things that stood out about the Romans in this story sort of fall into line with your your account of of those Greek heroes. It's it's the propensity for cruelty and and sort of lust for the the the, the games combined with being sort of magnanimous at the same time toward one's inferiors, generous towards one's peers. It, it's this sort of interesting set of combined traits that are fairly foreign to a Christian worldview because, you know, you have this sense of, well, once you have pure senses of moral equality, everyone ought to be treated sort of as they're due when everyone is due the same sort of moral treatment. And so you can't have this discontinuous attitude toward one kind of person or another, all while still seeing them as fully human. Mm -hmm. So that's, so it's, it's, it, it, it's the union of opposites in, in a sort of Judeo Christian mindset that I thought was was brought best to life in this novel. I don't think I've read a novel that does as good a job at exploring the psychological distance and, act, and actually making it real for the reader where you, you don't just see the... I, I've seen attempts to portray this where the, the reader is brought to view the Roman from explicitly Christian or Jewish morals and sees them then as just sort of irredeemably wicked but the distance isn't actually explained and the the cultural miscommunication isn't explained which you do yeah i just i this is what i set out to do i mean there are often there are attempts to to and some very good ones i think robert graves is i claudius books bring out the roman attitude to disability yes very well. yeah that's I mean, but one. Robert Clays was, Graves was not only a great writer, he was an eminent classicist in his own right, a very fine translator. But, uh, he, but he, he only could do one thing, and he's doing that imperial family, which is very well documented. We've got lots of Roman historians writing about it. There's lots of information in it, that kind of thing. So all he could really do was show the disability thing and how poor Claudius has to just the expectation is we don't care if you're disabled and it's harder for you. You, either, you you push yourself to hell and back and make yourself as normal as possible because people are not going to accommodate you. And so he has to fix his stutter. He has to come to learn to speak. And if he doesn't and if he dribbles on himself, he's, they all just sit around and laugh at him. They just make him a, he's the butt of everybody's jokes. And, yeah. and yet at the same time, people who you would think are bad people for making the butt of all their jokes are not portrayed as otherwise particularly bad people. This is just something that Romans do. I mean, because yeah. the only the only reason he survived is poshness, because a normal Roman family, a child with an obvious disability, it was probably cerebral palsy or something like that. There's problems with walking. The scissors gate that he's described as having is associated with cerebral palsy. In a you know even in a relatively middle class, well to do Roman family that wasn't aristocracy, he would have just been exposed. Or, yeah. e- or and either exposed or the thing is, exposed was the most common thing. But they did. Ha- there was the right in Roman law where the child was the infant was hideously disabled, and even to a degree, the expectation that as long as he got his wife's consent to do it, so not just the exposure, was to snap the neck, the paterfamilias, the male head of household, to snap the child's neck. You know, and uh, 
so you've just got this really – and Robert Graves does that really well in the I, Claudius, brings that out in, in the I, Claudius books. But I just thought the underlying logic of the Romans is the majority of people are born to serve, but if you have natural excellences, they make you a better person. And if that means either your owner or your employer, because I've got a society that's abolished slavery in these books for economic reasons – uh, thinks you should be lifted up because you have a natural excellence from the gods or that you've inherited. Yeah, they had, Because they were Darwin before Darwin, they had a sense of things running in families. So, you know, the, they got that. They'll do it in the sculpture. But one of the things that a book that I've just been sent recently points out how there's a sculpture of a well-known Roman woman who was related to one of the emperors and it's the cousin or something. And it's very deliberately pointed out that her and the emperor's portrait have got the same chin. You know, a lot of care has been shown that, that, to, that these two people are related to each other and that this particular talent that they have runs in families. So I had to bring that out and that has consequences for their legal system, which looks once again, so you get the same thing as with um, Symmachus, the senator, uh, you get something that looks really modern because it's got all the same characteristics as the 19th century common law or 18th century, 19th century common law. This is a society that was starting to proto-industrialise, that was starting to have factories, that uh, had a very strong sense of the law of contract, understood very, very difference between co a relationship governed by contract, which is one-to-one, -one, a relationship governed by tort, which, which is, is one to those to whom you owe a duty, you know, so... It was delict, the word is used in, in Latin, is delictual liability. Understood the idea of, of, of property in the person, typical of a slave owning society. So you have a concept like in, in Uria, you know, your reputation can be injured and it, you, it's just passed into modern defamation law uh, across the European continent and to a degree in Scotland. So it looks really English. You, this society can look really English. It's got functioning courts, it's got a proper legal system, it's got a police force. It's got the rule of law. It's got, you know, the ability to, you know, the, uh, very early moves against self-help. You know, like the Roman lawyers, you cannot adjudicate this dispute. You know, the two blokes having a punch up, having a square go out in front of the pub or people having fights over that, you know, their kid, their son's gone off and shagged a girl and got her pregnant and that don't turn up with the Roman equivalent of a shot. <laughs> this needs to be mm -hmm. dealt with through the courts, you know, that kind of thing. So you've got all the things that you associate with the development of a modern legal system, which is why it's the other great rival legal system to the common law, because it's extraordinary. They are extraordinary lawyers. But you've also got a situation, and many of your listeners will be Christian, um, so I'll put a little bit of a gloss on it because there are some details in the, in the story that would have happened that have been left out. But you're probably, a lot of Christian listeners will be familiar with the story in the Acts of the Apostles of a uh, Paul being arrested for public order offence, and in, in this case, getting up and preaching Christianity in a Jewish venue where they didn't want him. Okay, they, mm -hmm. they, I, th I think it was a synagogue, but I'm not sure. Um, and they didn't want him there. They wanted him to leave, and he wouldn't leave. And so the police were called, police, and they're just called soldiers in the in the text. But they, this would have been the police, and he's taken away, and he's taken to the police station, and they're about to flog him. And he says, "I'm a Roman citizen." And that's just an incredibly basic thing. And he shows his papers. And anyone who's been on holidays to Europe, particularly going back a few years, they've learnt that Brits and Americans don't like it. But if you're a little bit older and you went to Italy, say, 20 years ago, you'll have had the experience of being asked for your passport at the desk when you check into a hotel and then the man and the, or woman at the desk takes away your passport and gives you your room key in exchange for it and puts the passport <laughs> behind them. <laughs> and it's a really unpleasant sense. It, it, I remember the first time it happened to me and I, I can read the ancient language. I know what they're like. Um, mm -hmm. It's really shocking to someone from a common law system because the state wanted to know, and this is part of the duty of the censor who was a figure in Roman administration was to always know where everybody was. That was part of the census because this was the first <laughs> civilization that did that. And so that means knowing where everybody is at any one time, which of course can be exploited horribly. It's one of the reasons why the Nazis were able to kill so many Jews was because they knew where they all lived. 
Exactly. It would have been, everyone knew, and Hitler admitted it, in a, well, no, not Hitler himself because he wasn't there, but at the House de Bonsay conference where the, the conference to plan the Holocaust was held in early 1941, they admitted that this would be an absolute nightmare in Britain because Britain doesn't do that because they were still quite confident of being able to conquer the British Isles. And, then, well, nobody knows where anybody lives <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. because that's not what they do. You know, and here's you, here you've got Hydric and Eichmann all going sort of stewy, boiled again kind of kind yeah, of thing. We're not going to be able to do it. <laughs> we're not going to be able to do it, or not easily anyway. And so that, that sense of being able to prove that you are a certain class of person and it meant something really dramatic in this case, they couldn't just flog him, you know, beat the crap out of him with the rattan like you see in Singapore. They couldn't do that to him because he was a Roman citizen and Roman citizens could not be tortured. Non-citizens could be tortured but only on application to court and slaves could be tortured as of right. Different rules for different people. Different people. And yet none of those people are seen as less than fully human at any point. Right. It's a legal status, not a moral one. And so I just thought almost nobody does this as a writer with a book set in the classical world. And when they do it, the books can become boring and they can be weighed down with too much explanation and so on and so forth. So I thought what I will do is I will do what a science, I'll do what Robert Heinlein does or I will do what Margaret Atwood does. I will create this my knowledge of this society and bring their values and their legal system to it, but I will give them our modern technology so that there's less of a gulf with the technical things that they can do and leave the morality intact. That then behooved me to do a couple of other things. One, different moral values lead to different technological development. I had to acknowledge that. I was about halfway through book one when I realised that. Well, no, this is a society that's already heading down the path to Darwin. They're going to have natural – the origin of species is going to be before, before laws of motion. So they're going to get science in a different order because of the things that they valued and thought were important. You know, right. it's, it's not any irony that the best doctors in the Roman world were doctors of the gladiators because they saw people chopped up. It's dissection. Yes. Probably the most famous Roman doctor, who was Marcus Aurelius's physician, started as a doctor of the gladiators, the guy who knew that the heart was pumping, and which we forgot. And it's so that means science is in a different order. So the thing that comes first is biology, and then it goes backwards. It, then, it, then it goes to chemistry because there are certain things in biology you can't do without chemistry, and then it goes from chemistry to finally to physics. So I had to have them behind, the, and it, it's a bipolar world. It's like the Cold War. So I have them behind the Han Chinese who have gone in the Western direction with physics first, and the Romans are kind of horrified because the Chinese have just sent a rocket into low Earth orbit, and that's at the beginning of, that's at the beginning of Kingdom of the Wicked Book One and because Pilate is, is watching television and, and right. seeing this report. And so he sees the report. He yeah. sees the report about, oh, low Earth orbit. Yes. <laughs> they know what it is because they've got physics, but they're behind the Chinese, the Han Chinese, the, the Serres, as they call them, in this area. But they are massively ahead in genetics and biology and surgery and medicine because they've done, they started with Darwin at about the same time period in terms of years elapsed as we had Newton. So I had to do all of that. So all their scientific things are different. They're in a different order because they're starting from a different moral position and the things that interest them are in a, starting in a different moral position. And I then had to, I had, had the issue of, okay, so this is in ancient Judea. What is it about the Jews and the Romans in the period that made them at each other's throats? And what I didn't want to do, which is what you were alluding to earlier, was produce this situation where one side or the other are seen as the baddie. And I think I said, I don't know whether I said it for a Law and Liberty piece or it might have been actually for the Australian or the Wall Street Journal. It was might have been for another outlet. But I know you've read it because we were discussing it once and where I said I don't want a society where it's all shade an all light on one side or the other and I don't want a dystopia because I don't write dystopias and this I made a very deliberate decision that the society and kingdom of the wicked works 
but it's not a utopia. And I didn't want the idea, I didn't want people, although this did later happen, unfortunately, to write to me and then say, oh, I'd actually quite like to live there. I got a lot of letters like that after the, the first book, people saying, oh, I think I like your society and I think I think this society would work really well and so on and so forth. And I was just sort of sitting there going, presumably that means you have to be one of the Roman citizen characters then. You don't want to be. Exactly. You don't want to be a, a, a poor non-citizen. A wealthy non-citizen like someone like Fortini is okay because she's quite posh. She's a non-citizen, but she's quite posh, so she's fine. But a poor non-citizen you know, in a society with no welfare state because they just don't, why, do you, why are you paying poor people to stay poor? Doesn't this mean yeah. you will have more of them? This is just Roman logic. And they have that, they have that sort of ruthlessness and lack of concern. Again, I think that it goes back to this very Christian sense of equality. Mm. If, if, if you lack that, you are not going to develop any of these sympathies for lessers. I mean, now, like, there are conceptions of noblesse oblige you see in the story. Yes, oh, the Romans absolutely had that. That And right. that later passed um, into the medieval civilizations afterwards and actually it informed the, the development of codes of chivalry and things like that, which is actually hugely important. You, you need things like chivalry and warrior codes. It happened in Japan as well with Bushido um, because otherwise right. people can't tell the difference between mounted warriors and gangs, murderous, murderous gangs on horseback. You can't tell the difference between the knight in shining armor and the highwayman. Yeah. <laughs> it's really important. Well, and, <laughs> and, you know, you, you don't want war to be entirely unbounded yes. destruction. And destructive. You want limits. Mm. And I, I also think that there's, there's a sense in which you, you see conce- concepts in a story like this play out in a really strange way in the American South, for instance, like Mm -hmm. noblesse oblige, which you see portrayed in many of the Roman characters Mm -hmm. is part of the white Southerner Americans inability to understand people like Martin Luther King demanding Mm -hmm. a certain kind of status when generations before them would come hat in hand and say, please give me, Mm -hmm. please pay for a school and the person was happy to oblige mm. because their relative status as the as the southerner saw it was respected mm. like and the posh equality defended it yeah. yeah like the posh lady in in the book and then you see this all over the roman empire who set up the beautiful library the agrippa memorial library in the name of the general who was her ancestor mm-hmm. and written on the plinth underneath a bust of agrippa is dar sua pecunia fecit built with her own money, you mm. know, that kind of thing. Because that's what that's the noblesse oblige of, of the posh Roman. And I, I put a lot of effort into, into portraying that culture. But there's radical, this radical inequality uh, that's legally mandated. It's not morally mandated. So people can suddenly shift. So like Fatini, mm. who goes from being a non-citizen to being paired off with a posh Roman, is immediately instructed by the matter familias in Pilate's in Pontius Pilate's household to stop referring to them by their titles. Mm-hmm. No, you don't use our titles anymore because you're engaged to him, and he, you're an equal. He yeah. went to the academy. Romans didn't call them universities; they called them academies. Uh, he went to the academy with Pontius, and so therefore you are our friend. Mm-hmm. That whole Roman idea of friendship, which was hugely important. And so she has to stop calling them by their, and she keeps stumbling because she wants to call them by their titles because it's just been drilled into her non citizen, even though she's quite a well off non citizen and well educated and, you know, and very charming and so on and so forth and had lots of advantages in life. She's still a non citizen. And so she keeps stumbling and doesn't know that she, she must not call them by their titles anymore. And there are rules and order that if you fail to observe them in this novel, in this world, yeah. there are consequences that aren't easy to overcome, even when you've been elevated. Yes. Yeah. And, and well, yes, because of course she's, she's, this is the other thing. And this is a radically different thing with Christianity as well. The Romans had high class prostitutes and people have got this idea in, in their head. They think, oh, they mean an escort. They mean someone who's, 
a bit higher up the tree, that kind of thing. No, mm-hmm. no, no. These were high class prostitutes that you actually had to doff your cap to. <laughs> you know, sometimes mm-hmm. they were part of the state religion. And so, and Fortini, the Greek lass who's who's been one, uh, she falls into that category. So she's she's the equivalent of university educated. She's very clever. She's very charming. She can think circles around lots of the other people in involved with the book, and I show her doing this quite regularly because she is very clever. And so, so she's used to having status. And one of the things I had to do to show, if I was going to put all this time and effort into making sure I got the Roman morality and attitudes right, I had to do that for Jews in that period as well. And Judaism, exactly. and Judaism changed after the destruction of the temple and after the Bar Kokhba revolt. Before that period, Jews were basically a lot bolshier. I think it's probably the best way of describing it. They were just a lot bolshier. They really did think they had they had moral tickets on themselves that Romans considered to be unearned. You know, they had, weren't a, a big enough and fancy enough civilization. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, they weren't the Greeks, they weren't the Persians, which were these other great civilizations in the area. They were a sort of intermediate stage. They weren't barbarians because they had a written language and they had a law and they had an ancient religion, which all were things Romans respected those things. But they certainly couldn't put themselves on par with Greece. They couldn't put themselves on par with Persia. And the, th- and the, and the problem was, of course, was you had comparison by reference because they were in the middle of those other two other great civilizations, the Hellenistic civilization that expand, expanded with Alexander the Great and also the rival, the great rival civilization that had always been and continued to be for hundreds and hundreds of years, even thousands of years, was, of course, Persia. And so they were seen to have ideas above their station. By, but, yeah, the, the, the bucket of achievements wasn't enough for the sort of moral tickets they had on themselves as far as Romans were concerned. And so I had to try to portray Jews fairly and accurately. And this involved, and the difficulty I've got here is I can read Greek and Latin. I can't read Hebrew. I can't read Aramaic. So I was relying enormously on my Jewish friends who can read Hebrew and one other friend who actually learnt ancient Aramaic as well as some um, ancient Iranian. You know, so I could get wow. the get the sort of culture of the people involved because there were two things I had to get right. Not only did I have to give Jews in the period fair play in their relationship with the colonial power, I also had to get divisions between different groups of Jews, right, because a lot of Jews at the time looked at the early Christians and thought they were completely bonkers and it wasn't just for things, obvious things like the rules about circumcision and stuff that comes up in Acts, but also because things like hell. The Jewish conception of hell in that period, if they believed it, and not all Jews did, there was a variety amongst different kinds of Jews, um, Mm -hmm. lots of different Jewish approaches and and lots of arguments. This is still a big part. This was already a part of Jewish culture, all the rabbis in the temple disagreeing with each other in very learned and clever ways. So the idea of someone being sent to eternal punishment forever, a lot of Jews found really alarming. And one aspect of Christianity that, that comes up and up and up again in, in Jewish writers from that period is the idea that the people in heaven could see the people in hell being tortured. Mm. And the Jewish response to that, which I think is really interesting, was very much, you got that, that off the Romans, didn't you? <laughs> because it's the idea of watching <laughs> terrible cruelties. Because one thing mm-hmm. the Jews were consistent about and this is to their credit, and I bring that out, I bring this out very strongly in the book, is they hated the Roman blood sport. They weren't real keen on the Olympic Games either because it was all these people, all these blokes running around in the buff with their bits flying around, Uh, but they would just turn their backs on that, go, no, that's for the Greeks. But they hated Roman blood sport. They thought it was absolutely appalling. Yet by the same token, they did things like, stoning women for adultery, that if the Romans caught them doing it, they would just get all the men who were involved in stone. They'd rescue the woman and they and then they'd execute, uh, the, they'd men. execute the men. Yep. And all I've, uh, so it was like, I mean, and what I used I, in order to, to capture this, I didn't just use Roman records. I tried to ca- use another example of where civilizations just were incredibly different and were both very cruel, but in different ways. 
Australian Aborigines would see convicts in early in the when Australia was a penal colony being flogged, lined up at the triangle and flogged. You know the thing from the Royal Navy, which was exported out to the, the, the when Australia was a penal colony and convicts were being transported transported from the British Isles. And Aborigines would see this and they would be appalled by it and they would try to stop it. And you know, and you get these big brawny. Aboriginal tribesmen who were really strong and really fit and had spent all their lives like running around with spears and hunting kangaroos. So they could they were often much stronger than the than the British floggers. And so you'd have situations where there'd be an enormous punch up and then the Aborigine would win. But then you'd have situations like in nearly all of the Aboriginal communities that the white white colonials found, if a woman gave birth to a set of twins, they would kill one. They would kill one of the twins. I did twins. not know that. Because the thing is there was a risk that the if you had tried to take breastfeed two at once, that only one would survive anyway. So it was best to pick the strongest one, yeah. keep it alive and kill the weakling. And so European yeah. colonials saw this and were just horrified. So you had the same thing again. Yeah. So you had this terrible cruelty in both these civilizations, but what they defined as cruel was completely different. So I've, yeah. I've got this with the Romans. So you've got this, I mean, all I've done is modernize the weapons because it's so well documented. So you've got Jews being absolutely horrified with the Roman games and the Sanhedrin trying to stop it from, you know, st- trying to stop fights to the death basically happening in the area of Jerusalem, which the Romans had a degree of respect for. They respected the Sanhedrin. They were considered to, that they admired the temple that Herod had built and they thought it was well run. They thought it was a beautiful building and they thought it was well run. So I just brought those attitudes forward and modernised the weapons, basically, and and a few other little details, and but then you've also got the situation of, of if if a Roman patrol caught Jews stoning a woman for adultery or that kind of thing, they would just rescue the woman and execute the men, <laughs> you know, and instead right. of, instead of chopping them off with a sword, they're just lining them up and going bang. <laughs> it's yeah. Of, yeah. Well, and I, and I remember reading accounts of the British Empire. With uh, the Indian practice of sati, sati, the, yeah. the sati, the British would do the same thing. Yes, they, they did the they same would, thing. You know, we, we, you have a custom of burning. I remember, I remember the quote from a, from a, L- a British officer. Lord was, Napier. You, I actually yeah, paraphrase you, Lord Napier in the yeah. book, but I give the words to a Roman, a, a Roman official, yeah. rather than yeah. But, you uh, have this custom, and so do we. we. And our custom, <laughs> once you've burnt the, if you burn the widow and we catch you, our custom is to build a gallery right next to where you've done it and then to hang you by the neck until you are dead. <laughs> so it's it's the same thing, though. And I'm not a cultural relativist. I don't think that all cultures are the same. I mean, I mean, so, sometimes you can have a situation where it's the devil against Beelzebub. You know, so the Spanish conquistadors were pretty awful. and But you have to say, well, I think the Incas and the Aztecs were kind of worse. But it really is yeah. the devil against Beelzebub. Whereas yeah. the, there are two empires in human history, the Romans and the British, where this is much, much harder to say because they generally did leave the places they colonised better than they found them. So I had to capture that as well. And there was a, there was a very good review in the, in the main British fantasy magazine over here, British Fantasy Society, I think it is, written by a woman who's also a classicist, although she's an Egyptologist, so she specialises in ancient Egypt. And she made the point, we're all very used to the empire being portrayed as the baddies. You know, this is all the whole Star Wars thing and that kind of thing. But she said that showed, that just shows you that a lot of science fiction is written by Americans who have a very different conception of mm-hmm. empire, despite being an empire themselves. And so she said, this is a book that's sort of, well, actually, maybe Darth Vader had a point. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and the fascinating thing for me, though, is you you have a little hypothesis in it too of how would the romans have imposed their empire on the mayans and the aztecs mm. and company they would not have ended human sacrifice no they would not have no, they don't stopped. they trade with them yeah they trade with them and the closest yeah. they will come to it is you get individual moral conscience amongst romans because they've abolished slavery but they don't react like the british They've abolished slavery for economic reasons themselves because they've worked out comparative advantage and they've worked out Mm -hmm. if you don't abolish slavery, then human labour power never loses its comparative advantage. You want a more buoyant economy, you a more prosperous economy, you need labour markets. So they've worked that out because, of course, that's the kind of thing that goes with 
Darwin, 18th century, 19th century, that kind of very contractual legal art, legalistic thinking. So it flows quite naturally. But what they don't do, unlike the great and the good of the British Empire, and this, I just set this up really deliberately, is the civilization next door, which are which is the, the local rival, imperial rival, not as powerful but still very impressive, is Persia, and Persia still has slavery. And I make it very clear that on the margins of the empire where the Persian border is butting up against the Roman border, there's human trafficking going on because mm-hmm. the Romans won't do what the Brits did. The Romans will not send out their navy and say, you will not trade in slaves. We're not going to do it. And if they finish up in our country, they're instantly free because we don't have slavery. We won't send them back to you so they don't do something like the fugitive slave law. They don't do that either. It's mm-hmm. this inter- interestingly moral intermediate approach. But they're not. we're not going to stop you, Persia, from still having slaves. And so what you finish up getting is you get individual Stoics. I have to, my moral, my Quakers are the Stoics. I get individual Stoics like Claudia Procula, who is Pilate's wife, and her dad was a Stoic and grandfather was Stoic abolitionist. And so what she does is she sets woke rules for her household servants. You will not Mm -hmm. buy chocolate that has come from the Mexica and the Inca and made by slaves, you have to get non-slave chocolate. You, know, you will not get sugar. <laughs> from, yeah. and she's setting all these rules, which is exactly what people did in the 18th century in, yes. in Britain. But the thing is, it was not the kind of thing that just people with their purchasing power could achieve by themselves. It was not possible. You needed to get the backing of the state, and they were very fortunate that the anti-slave state that from which they won backing just happened to be the greatest power in the world at the time with a navy. And so the navy yes. enforced it. I don't. No, I mean, I, the British, the British navy did it. Yeah, the British that navy did it. Just, the, just sent all the slave British traders. British navy <laughs> sunk the slave traders. Slunk, sunk they the fought sla- a war to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. sent them to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> that kind of thing. So my <laughs> Romans don't do that, and because they're not the British, they're not Christian, and they don't have this idea of a, of a sense of oh no, you, yeah, this is bad. We can't have that. You know, we can't have that in our backyard. It's not going to happen. And, and so we're going to bring it to an end. So they don't do that. So they are much less like the kind of good guys that we associate with goodness because they don't do the same kind of moral goodness. But they do do a lot of other good things, the good things that people like your founding fathers noticed in the Federalist Papers, which which was a Mm -hmm. a great read for me to, to see this. They do peace, order, good government. You know, and because I've modernised the technology, it's the trains run on time, the water is clean, the lights stay on. You know, so right. it starts becoming a Monty Python joke then. You know, what have the Romans done for us? You know, it's safe to walk the streets at night. Indoor plumbing. Indoor plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they do, so- they do that and you just get this moral complexity. And I had a lot of fun doing that, but it was partly me just saying I am fed up with – People portraying the early Christians as all good guys when they were much more morally ambiguous than that and you have to go and read Jewish sources to get the sense of the moral ambiguity. I I do actually think some of the writing about the early Jewish opposition to Christianity is quite racist. You know, the the, the response, when they didn't get the Jews to come on board, basically, the traditional observant, Mm -hmm. the Jews who became the kind of Jews everywhere, you know, the ones who stayed yeah. Jewish, whether they were Sephardic or Ashkenazi or whatever, I don't that division hadn't developed at that point, it came later. But the, the real Jews, uh, and they, they don't get on board with the new religion, even though it looks, it is basically what type of Jew are you? Christianity is really, really, particularly at the beginning, it's really close to Judaism. And then they just get written off. You know, I hadn't realised how close a lot of the things that the early Jesus followers were saying was the things that actual Pharisees were saying. And yet the Pharisees are written off as horrible people who bent as bobby pins and this kind of yeah. thing. So, so I had to try to capture that complexity in the civilization at the time and 
give everybody light and shade, give my characters light and shade. So there are bad Jews, there are good Jews, there are bad Christians, there are good Christians, there are bad Romans, there are good Romans. And I tried to bring my legal background to show what can go wrong in a society that has the rule of law. And mm-hmm. I tried to bring that out strongly. This is, you know, even in lawgiver societies, what can go wrong with those societies? And I mean, you, you get sort of the mental image of it. Even in the common law system, torture had become incredibly rare. But it, I always tweet on on Fire Night, 5th of November, the two images of Guy Fawkes's signature before and after torture. Mm-hmm. Now, the common law was a great improvement on law anywhere else in the world. They had to get a warrant, not just from a judge, they had to get a warrant from the king to torture Guy Fawkes. But they did torture him. They broke all his fingers until they got the confession out of him. And mm. so, and, and generations of British school children still chant, and they have no idea why, because unless they go to a good, good school that teaches history, you know, and remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. So, so I wanted to pivot to your earlier work, but not so much uh, for us to do the same thing, plot summary and, and talking about themes of the book. What, what, what struck me the most after reading The Hand That Signed the Paper uh, and the controversy around it was the way in which it dredged up for me the comparisons between 1990s political correctness and the, the sort of proto-cancel culture that existed then. Um, which by the time I hit university was being laughed at and pretty much on the way out, except for studies departments, mm. mercifully. But but it still had this heavy echo. You 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 read conservative or libertarian publications of the era, and they are still talking about with the fresh wounds from this, mm. which you received some of. I, I guess I, I just wanted to have you, you know, maybe compare your experience of of being canceled before that was a word mm. uh, to the weirdness we now inhabit i mean it was it was much harder in the 1990s i I should probably tell you the hand that signed the paper was published in 1994 um i was still an undergraduate at the time i was doing arts law and as i said earlier i stopped doing the law because i thought i was going to be a full-time writer and that turned to be to be a very silly idea and the it was much harder to cancel someone you still had the old idea that any publicity is good publicity, and particularly when you've got something to sell. And so I have to right. acknowledge, I mean, one of the reasons why I became a person in their 20s who owned a house free and clear and I'm mortgaged was because my first novel was a bestseller. And that caused problems of its own. Freddie de Boer, who's a modern writer, he has a sub stack and he's written an article. And if you read nothing else by this guy, because he has some quite weird economic ideas that are really quite... <laughs> Bonkers. But this this one piece, it's called The Rage of the Creative Underclass. And I think he he might have modeled it, he might have paraphrased it. So, you know, the, the creative underclass is still raging. Words to that effect. You will you will find it very quickly if you Google on either of those phrases. And he talks about the number of people who want to be successful as artists of whatever sort, in my case as a novelist, compared to the number of people who actually finish up being successful and it's literally basically boatloads compared to a rowing eight it really is it's a power in mathematics they call it a power law which is where basically uh 10 of the people make 90 percent of all the money Mm -hmm. in the creative arts so that led to issues as well like terrible terrible envy that someone in their 20s had won all these prizes and was making all this money so there was that going on i actually had the books written about me where a significant part of the complaint was how dare this young woman make lots of money out of being a novelist basically just thinking um if i'd have actually finished the law degree i'm not that far behind the ahead of what i would have been making as a as a as a corporate lawyer I hate to break it to you you know this is, this is it's why i went back to being a lawyer actually when i didn't have another novel to sell i needed to do something else because you know once you have a house paid for you can't just sit in there you need to like pay the bills and feed yourself and yes. all of the other things so it was harder to cancel someone then in the sense that if they had a book or a record or something like that you finished up just causing it to sell a lot more copies but you did have all of the other things. So I had 
people writing to employers if I was consulting or doing, and this went on for years. It was, it, it was actually the last really serious time for it was uh, when I was being cross-admitted in Scotland so I could practice as a Scottish solicitor as, as well as one in England and Wales. I had formal representations made to the Law Society of Scotland that I was not a fit and proper person to be admitted to practice, that kind of thing. And that was in 2012, 1994, 2012, really, yeah. really long gap. Mm. The other thing that was at the epicentre of all of this nonsense was humanities and social science departments. When I went through, it was the humanities departments. And because of this Australian cultural tradition of blending law degree with something else, it's meant to make you more rounded and polished. That's the theory. Okay. And it probably does. It means it may, uh, if you have a traditional liberal arts degree, not the modern ones, which are basically crap, woke crap, you know, bum paper now. But if you did a fairly traditional one, you actually learned something useful. You made you widely read. You know, I sort of read the whole of the English canon and quite a lot of stuff in in other languages as well, the ancient languages. So it hadn't completely colonised the humanities, but we were all being forced to do a certain amount of compulsory, these various compulsory theory subjects. So one of the reasons why, if you see me pop off about, you know, Derrida or, or Butler or, or Crenshaw or some woke idiot, is I actually read all their stuff because I was forced to read it as an undergraduate. I mean, I suppose I could have been lazy and just not read it, but this is probably going to say something about me. Because of my results in the languages, which I'm really good at, I was heading towards what in Australia is called a university medal. And in Britain, it'll be called something like a starred first or a congratulatory first. It's basically the mm -hmm. top of your year, something like yeah. that. I, I, remembering it's much, much harder even these days, but certainly going back 30 years to get really, really top marks in a British university system. The number of people who get firsts and the number of people above them who get firsts or you, starred firsts or university medals is tiny. So I was on track based on my grade point average for a university medal if you were just taking my language subjects. But the thing is, if I'd have wrote what I actually thought about the theory that we were being taught, theoretical nonsense, that we had to do the subject. There were six of these subjects and they were bloody compulsory and they'd only been made compulsory about two years before I started as an undergraduate in 1990, which is really annoying. I would have scuppered my chances as uh, yeah. for a university medal. And... I basically thought discretion is the better part of valour and lied in my assessment. So I played the game and got really high marks in all my theory papers. But I did actually read the stuff because I was building up this huge well of resentment against it. And this is something that is also, this is distinctively Australian and doesn't exist in any other country. The assessment... In many states, it's still the case, and certainly it was in the state that I was, Australia is a federal system like the United States, that I was completing my high school, high schooling in. A significant part of the assessment is like your, was at least, and I think it is, still is in most places, like your SATs. Mm -hmm. And SATs are basically the Aussie version, it's called the ASAT, the Australian Scholastic Aptitude Test. Gee, how original, let's just copy it off the Americans. And I, I think they were American tests, to be honest. They would just change things like right and left on the road and stuff like that, but they could use dollars. And as long as they didn't talk about dimes or quarters or anything like that, which they would just change. I think we were basically just sitting American tests. Because I, I remember one of the practice tests, they'd spelt colour, C-O-L-O-R, which an Australian uses British spelling, yeah. that kind of thing. So I'm pretty sure they're just American tests. They were, they were just adapting them. But what that means is the academic results you need on you need it on the ASAT to get into a law degree as opposed to the liberal arts degree, it was like 200 points apart. Difference, wow. And a SAT. The Aussie SAT, like the American one, is a very, very close proxy for IQ. And the thing is the results you needed to get into law or medicine would place you in the Mensa group. You needed to be in the top 2 to 3% of the, of the SAT result yes. to get into law or medicine. And whereas to get into just a straight liberal arts qualification, you'd be like hundreds of points behind. And so what that meant, and of course, in the enrolments in the, all the liberal arts faculties, is all the best results 
went to the law students. We would wipe the floor with all of the humanities intake. And the academics all knew it. They all knew who we were, you know, because of the student lists would come into the faculties and so they all knew who we were. And they all thought we were absolute, awful, arrogant shits. Excuse my French, you might have to edit that out. But (laughs) that is what they thought of us to the point where rude things were said and not just to me, I can can gather you a bevy of Australian arts law graduates who are either in the academy now or in private practice or have retired and who had this experience. Yeah, you know, we we would read some of this stuff that the liberal arts people are into, you know, the butlers and the Derridas and uh, the uh, Baudrillard and so on and so forth, and uh, all the American, American critical race theorists. I remember being introduced to the concept of intersectionality and, of course, the law students had all been taught set theory and logic. And, of course, that's what mm-hmm. she's trying to describe. She's trying to describe sets. And I just sat there and I just did, did this, this, this. This is what she's trying to describe, but she's not very smart, so she doesn't know how to do it properly. And, you just, <laughs> and I just got told, and it wasn't just me because other people were saying, doing the same sort of thing, was, will you law students shut up? We yeah. all know you hate us and you think that this is a giant wank and you're all going to go into practice and make squillions. This was the kind of response that we all got. And it wasn't just me, lots and lots of people who were doing the combined qualification got this. And so what it did with me is it, I built up this enormous wall of resentment over the, all of it. And I thought, this is just garbage. This has been taught at universities and it is absolute nonsense. And Australians are the most utilitarian people on God's earth. So, you know, all those lovely articles that Law and Liberty publishes about the wonderful beauty of classical education and its character forming and it makes people better and so on and so forth. The Australian response to that is, yeah, well, all the commanders in the NKVD and in the Buffin SS, they all had all these wonderful arty, arty party qualifications and look what nice people they were. Yeah. So the, show me the cash value. Yeah, show me education. the cash value of this education. And so the Australian one, uh, particularly amongst conservatives, is basically, and I have to say it's is mine, is uh, in, ad- adapted across to the UK. I would close four-fifths of British universities. All of the former polytechnics would go back to being polytechnics. They would teach trade qualifications. Mm. The way to learn, uh, get a liberal arts qualification is in a library. And the money saved would be to have public libraries and Project Gutenberg and all of that because the UK has got a shorter copyright term, you know, all over the UK. Mm. And if people are interested in that, they will educate themselves. They don't need some dodgy idiot at a university to do it for them. Yes, I realise. Australians are a a type that will inhabit the dying earth is a phrase that is sometimes (laughs) used about us. I think fairly probably. Yeah, we'll survive yeah. because we have to live in this country that's full of everything that wants to kill you. So I just thought this is dreadful. And so, I mean, people who are interested can read the introduction to the novel where I go through the literary hoax that I perpetrated. But I genuinely thought that the way to blow all this silly nonsense up was just to prove it wrong. And I have to say when the grievance studies hoax people did theirs, where they hoaxed all the academic journals. I did warn them at the time. I said, people won't thank you for this. And I've just done an interview on ABC Radio National where I said the the biggest lesson that I learned is that if you perpetrate an enormous literary hoax and you wrap all the people who take this stuff very seriously and genuinely believe it and you wrap them in a giant omelette, they will not thank you for it. They will hate you. And that's what well, they'll try to destroy uh, you, that's, which they're doing to the trio of grievous studies oh, authors. Yeah, authors. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what they tried to do to me. And it didn't really work because as I said, you couldn't really cancel people. Then you could make their lives really unpleasant. And there were things about my life that did become really unpleasant. There was a period there where I had police protection. There were a, a period there where the police took my post and I couldn't have the post delivered to my house because the police were concerned about what might be in it. Uh, I mean, the worst that had been in it that caused me to make a police report in the first place was I had people send me dog poop. They'd post pack it up. Australia Post had these things called post pack, and they posted up dog poo 
and I got it sent to me. So I went to the police about this and they said, oh, right, and they set this system up. And I basically, I had this thing that every other day I had to walk to the local police station just down the road from me and collect my sorted mail. And there was just stuff mm-hmm. I was not allowed to see and <laughs> that kind of thing. It was it was yeah. pretty unpleasant, yeah, that, that, that kind of thing. And I, it was my first inkling that the people who, a lot of them who taught this, this sort of liberal artsy people who just weren't very clever, to my thinking, they, they weren't clever and they weren't brave. They, they, they lacked courage as well. I mean, I just don't care what other people think of me. You can think I'm this, that and the other. I really don't care. And I can think you're this, that and the other. And just, you know, knock yourself out. I'm a columnist. I write disagreeable things in newspapers nearly every week. And if everybody started agreeing with me, I would start to worry because I'm an extremely disagreeable person. But now we're in this world where these people rely on the politics of of shaming and making people doubt the courage of their convictions by throwing words like racist or sexist or misogynist or misogynist or transphobic or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, and and now as you've written about recently, they're shaming corporations and publishers and everyone else to go along with this series of linguistic innovations which which otherwise aim they, at producing they say that, a flat world. Yeah, they, they say that it will produce harm. And, of course, that destroys the, the great 19th century Gladstonian liberal. I mean, although John Stuart Mill said it, it was sort of an indicia of 19th century British liberalism. They're destroying the harm principle because the whole basis of the harm principle is, is if it doesn't hurt, ha- harm others, you can do what you like. But the thing is you wreck that, you flatten it completely as soon as you say that words cause harm. You know, then you can't yes. raise the harm principle, the, the basis, the underlying basis of 19th century liberalism. You can't raise it as a shield. Now, the thing is, I I am aware. I mean, I've I, I had sort of I've talked to p- people about this that apparently the type of personality who doesn't care what other people think is quite rare. And the, the the thing is, this is a this is one of those things that you learn by watching Jordan Peterson videos. Basically, I didn't know anything about psychology. I did one psychology subject as a liberal crap, liberal arts undergraduate, and it was statistics, which was very useful. And they said to me, "Well, you just won the statistics prize. Would you like to come and do more psychology?" And I'd read a few psychology papers, and that I have, yeah, you know, they do things like n yeah. equals thirty five, and I just sit there and I go, "No, mm-hmm. nope, nope, I'm not doing any more psychology." <laughs> Why? What's your problem with psychology? I think your entire discipline is about as genuine as a pile of three dollar bills. I, I also yeah. said this to the philosophy department as well. Do you see the reputation of arrogant lawyers? And it wasn't just me, although. The bloke I shared the set theory and logic prize with was an engineer, and he said the same thing. This is this thing again. <laughs> the higher marks, the IQ you needed for engineering and law and medicine was like so much more than, than people who were just doing a straight science degree or a straight liberal arts qualification. And so you just had this aristocracy of the professions in Australian universities. It still exists as far as I am aware to a, to a large degree even now at the good universities at what gets called the sandstones, which are the old ones that go back to the late 19th century in the, in the capital cities of each of the states. And so it was just, but I found this thing out um, by watching a Jordan Peterson video of that this per- kind of personality that where well, you don't care what other people think is actually really quite rare. It's apparently to do with being extremely disagreeable and it's particularly rare in women. And mm-hmm. the normal thing is people don't like being criticised by others and their, their usual response in most humans is to sort of pipe down, to be quiet. Yes. And... I'm not like that. I mean, I don't have terrible manners. I'm not the kind of person who will then go out and just argue with people just for the sake of it. You know how some people on the internet are like that? They must be more disagreeable than me. They will just get into arguments for the sake of getting into arguments, which I won't do. I will often just, oh, you don't find that. I don't find that comedian funny. I won't go to his show. Whereas other people have to enter and have a have a big stooshy, as the Scots say, have a big stramash. I'm not like that. But so... And it's also that I'm not completely impervious to criticism. It's just I've got close friends whose opinions I value 
And I have family members whose opinions I value. And if they criticise me, I'd be really upset because they have things that they can, they know things about me and they know things about themselves, which means they have tremendous insight into my character and tremendous insight into their own character. And I was brought, I mean, this is sort of a family proverb that we were all brought up with that I got from my father was don't take criticism from people you wouldn't, where you wouldn't accept their advice. No, don't take criticism from people where you wouldn't take their advice. It works to that effect. And so w- when someone sort of carries on about me and says I'm this, that, and the other, I sit there and I go, hmm, at Donfart69 on Twitter thinks I'm a terrible person. I really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's you're not you're not my dad <laughs> basically yeah. yeah don't take criticism from people you wouldn't ask for advice that was the expression that my father used to used to he used to put it like that so the, this profile is apparently quite rare and i have to be aware of it but what it means is that because human beings i think if we had a planet full of people like me there would be punch ups all the time because i'm so disagreeable there would be i'm so disagreeable and just really disagreeable but it might also be a very polite society i mean you know consider the heinlein adage you know, an armed society is a polite society, society. Yeah, well, well, an equally disagreeable society really, might lead to politeness yes. um, <laughs> i mean I, well this is britain so we're basically disarmed but i am 6 foot 1 and 80 kilos and can punch pretty hard so it's, it's, it's that I don't know, but it's so what they're relying on this now. This tendency is to get people to shut up by criticizing them and shaming them, and most people are happy to go along with that. And the thing that is in addition to it, and this to me is actually the most important part because I experienced it admittedly late on in the game, and it then later went away because I kicked up an enormous ruckus. You know, I was, I had the weapons to defend myself by that. At this point, I was a corporate lawyer of some experience, that kind of thing. And I just, I'm just not copying any crap from you people anymore. I am going to grind you into the dirt. And I did. You know, I used my connections. I used the fact that I knew politicians in Australia, that kind of thing. You know, if people are going to persist in this behaviour, I'm going to make their lives very difficult in return. And I think it was part of the reason why just everybody just backed off from me was you know, I will make you pay for this and I will make it hurt you and you won't be able to keep doing it. I'm going to stop being polite and I'm going to stop being nice. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think because some of the criticism that came, a lot of the criticism that came at me was from the organised Jewish lobby, I think the fear was that I would just defect, defect to the pro-Palestine side um, and because being pro-Palestinian gives you cover to, to really hack into, into Jews and criticise them in ways that if you're not pro-Palestinian, you can't really get away with. I didn't ever want to do that, but I think that that was the suspicion that would happen. I have seen people do that. They have used it as cover to just go, right, you try to get people cancelled, I'm going to make everybody think that you're an arsehole who's trying to run the world. And I've seen Mm -hmm. people do this completely cynically as well. So, you know, in a completely cynical way, oh, here's an opportunity for me to take down a lobbying outfit and it doesn't matter how much money they've got, everyone just ignores them and writes them off and thinks they're whinging, which is another outgrowth of this as well. So what has happened is you now get overwhelmingly, I only got it a bit, you know, only to a degree because it it started in the 90s and you couldn't really do it very effectively then. What you get now is the deliberate attempts to destroy people's careers and what they do is the, the classic thing is they get a person who's a, got a mortgage and three kids and deprive them of the ability to speak because of the, of the, the, the great Bacon, Francis Bacon line, he who hath wife and children hath hostages, have given hostages to fortune. You know, so you have to shut up. Suddenly, uh, in order to keep paying your bills and to pay your house off and to send your kids to school and to do all the things of a normal life in a developed country, is only possible if you are quiet. And that has become, to me, the standout feature of modern cancel culture. The harsh criticism, I see what the Jordan Peterson point, that most people find it really wounding when they're harshly criticised and accused of being a racist or sexist or whatever. I mean, I'm sorry, the response to that is just to go, the burden of proof is on the propounder. You've not proved, you've not proven a damn thing, go fly a kite, you know, talk to the hand, tell someone who cares, 
because I don't. You know, that is very much my response to all yeah, of these. And, and anyone who offers that response on one level is fine yeah. unless they they're vulnerable to the the hostage to the, ho- the hostage the unless they can unless yeah. they have hostages to fortune and to yeah. me i mean i have no problem when there's a bad behavior i mean i'm a lawyer and i have no problem with u- using the power and the tools of the law to stop the behavior people who try to get someone sacked for their views it should be a um, possibly criminal but certainly delictual uh, certainly a tortious liability let's make it a tort Interference with him, with uh, with an employment contract, bang that, bang them with the tort, finish finish up in court. Now, now let's see how big and brave you are when you're trying to get a gender critical feminist sacked or or whatever it is. I have zero. This is where I'm once again. Yeah, the Australians are the type who will inhabit the dying earth. This is where I, I have zero principles about you know oh the state shouldn't do this or use the levers of power to legislate against people's behaviour or so on and so forth. States have been doing this for a million years, and if the law doesn't work, the law becomes an ass, then it falls into disuetude. It's one of the reasons why yeah. abortion was decriminalised in the United Kingdom was because the CPS couldn't get any prosecutions, and it was bringing the law into disrepute. It wasn't just the feminists; it was just that juries were just sitting there going, "We're not going to prosecute." We're not, we're not it's, it's like it's like yeah. what's happened with the war on drugs in your country. With in Britain, it was abortion yeah. and infanticide. I mean, I suspect it probably has happened with the war on drugs drugs in the UK a bit as well. But I know less about that. I know the history with abortion yeah. and infanticide. Yeah, you just get juries going, "Nope." Bye. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Uh, But the thing is, if you can make legal mechanisms, that's why I I prefer a a civil suit with this kind of thing, because then a lot of these people are middle class professionals who engage in this behaviour. If you force them to put their hands in their pockets, they'll, oh, oh, okay, yeah, that that would be bad. It might have an effect on my mortgage. So, yeah, I would have no problem with adding another, another tort of inter- interference with, imp- with an employment contract, put it on the books. That, I just, I just uh, think that uh, that's how they're winning. That's how they do it. And the, and the hatred that is directed against left-leaning people who can't be held to ransom in that way, even if they do have a spouse and children, is just off the scale because they can't be touched. And the two that come to my yes. mind, one American and one Britain, is Joe Rogan in America and J.K. Rowling in the UK. They, they're both so rich and so famous and, and so unconcerned. And so unconcerned. With- you know, you've just got Joe Rogan having a spliff on national telly. I mean, yeah. it's just hilarious. And have you seen Joe Rogan? Um, jo- not Joe. JK Rowling, every time people are going, Do you want this to be your legacy on Twitter? And she just quote tweets them with the royalty check eases the pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's her version she's of, of Joe Rogan having his massive split. <laughs> yeah. And in the absence of people like this being willing to publicly show spine, it's much harder for anyone else to. Yeah, so it is, mm, it's 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 wonderful they do exist mm, because it gives people who who think their employers might back them mm, uh, in sort of middling public spaces yeah. the willingness to take risks they otherwise wouldn't. I do. think this is absolutely crucial. I mean, my personal legal solution to the problem. I mean, I've mentioned the idea of a tort, which was actually that that argument, which has been written at length in a law journal, was re- developed by an Australian academic private or specialist private lawyer, Professor Katie Barnett at the University of Melbourne. She came up with that idea. But there are other, th- there are other social conditions where you can use the law as a, as a tool. My personal fix, if you really wanted to just completely wreck cancel culture and its ability to destroy people's lives, you import uh, the First Amendment rules from the United States to cover your public spaces, and then you import Australia's industrial relations legislation, labour labour law, which is very, very protective of employees and makes it extremely difficult to sack an employee because of their views or their religion or, you know, something that's come out of their mouths. Uh, And they were developed in the 19th century when Australia was considered the working man's paradise and one of the ways employers had tried to 
back down the labour unions was if someone was a labour organiser, they'd sack him. And so the courts and then industrial. They developed they protections. Developed protections. First it was the courts, but then it, it was actually mandatory arbitration and this sort of entire architecture of arbitration, conciliation and arbitration and a very strong labour laws is actually written into the Australian constitution. So if you wanted to kill wokery dead using the law and you would still have all these people carrying on and you would still have people having to be brave when someone says mean things to them, I'm sorry, you can't fix that. You can't stop people saying mean things. But if you want a legal shield, you have a combination of the First Amendment and Australian Labor Relations, Industrial Relations Law. You do that and it's gone. You just kill it. Now that is something I could get behind. <laughs> but the thing is, a, a lot of Americans, you would have to, in your country, you would have to give up contracts at will. It's gone. Yeah. Okay, there are things you, I mean, the Australians find this very uncivilised when we find it out that this is a thing that exists in, in America. How can you have employer-provided health care and contracts at will? This does not compute. You have to separate those two or everywhere, everyone's jobs are going to be radically insecure. And the good things that you can get from contracts at will are wrecked by the fact that you've got health care attached to people's employment. This is stupid. You know, I, I have watched Australians uh, say this. <laughs> Yeah, well, it is stupid, and and you know, this is another one of these weird artifacts of World, oh, World War II. Because they, they couldn't uh, increase po- people's wage, wages, w- so they, wage had to, freezes, they had to yeah. give them they had to give them jo- jollies, as they call them in Britain. Had to give employees yeah. a jolly, and we've never gotten rid of them. Very silly. We've never very gotten rid of silly. them. So, well, this is the world we live in. But um, so this is I, I this think is the thing. Yes, it, there are similarities with what I went through, but I wouldn't be like a fifty-year-old retiree who is able to work part-time for Liberty Fund and then just do my other writing in my own house with all my bills paid. I'm not JK Rowling or Joe Rogan, but I can pretty much say what I think. I mean, within the law, because I come from a country that's got quite strict libel and slander laws, much stricter than the US. So you do have to be a bit careful in Britain about just mouthing off because people will you know, you can't get up, for example, and call a public figure a liar unless you can prove it on the balance of probabilities, Absolutely. that kind of thing. That's the, the way. That's what I mean. You have to be quite careful. But within the law, I've got a fair amount of freedom, and I'm not rich like either of those people, but I was able to survive a cancellation attempt. What seems to happen now is that unless you're very, very lucky, um, you people don't survive the cancellation attempts or they don't survive them in the same form. Like Kathleen Stock has become a pretty well-known writer in the UK. She's written a very successful book. She writes in the British press all across the political spectrum and so on, which is great. But and good luck to her. I'm 10 out of 10. 100, She's had to restart her uh, career. 100% success behind She's Kathleen seen- Stock. I, I think that this is terrific for her. But She was a full professor of philosophy at university. She probably thought she was going to be doing that until she was 65, perhaps even older because the retirement age in the UK now is about 68, which means people will work for a lot longer. And sometimes if an academic is very eminent, British universities will come to an agreement to keep them working if they're still able to do take a full academic load. Her entire career was just... and. I'm not quite sure if that would be to me like if suddenly my three novels were unpublished tomorrow. Even if I kept all my other gigs, even if I kept my job at a senior writer at Law and Liberty and so on and so forth, you know, I've got these sort of big chunks of things on my walls here that are books that I've written. And I feel when I look at Kathleen Stock, I feel, I look at her and I think that's basically what's been done. You know, her entire academic career, it's like somebody lit it on fire. And that to me is the, the thing that is the change now. And she's one who's come out relatively well. There are people who I know who've been cancelled who, for whatever reason, it, it goes back a few years. It was before people, before the Free Speech Union was set up in the UK that was able to use existing labour labor law in Britain, employment law, to defend people or before um, yeah, or the equivalent in Australia, once again, using labour law to protect, to protect employees. I mean, I know a guy who finished up in desperate poverty. I'm not going to say his name. Um, he, he's 
finally managed to climb out of it a little bit now, who was cancelled, in this case, by nasty feminists, okay, that's all I'll say, and he was cancelled and he lost his job and he lost his job and he was at Oxford, so we're not talking some dummy here. And he basically spent the next seven years with no work. He had to sell his house. He finished up, he, you know, he finished up in a hostel, you know, this kind of thing. And that's a relatively common story of, of what, particularly when they happened maybe, say, 10 years ago, where people literally did not know what was going on. I mean, the first po post piece I wrote about this kind of behaviour and treatment of employees and sacking them for their views was actually, and you're going to laugh when I say this, it was published in April 2015 and it was published in, of all places, The Guardian. <laughs> Do you think I would get published in The Guardian now, Helen Dale, senior writer at a, at a, at a centre-right American think tank? Yeah. Oh, gee, I think a pig just flew past my window. <laughs> No, and this is this is the ch this is the change in the world that we now inhabit. And absent great bravery, and a lot of employers having the same fortitude as these people we've been talking about, mm. you're going to have this or 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 a legal remedy. Yeah, or a legal remedy. I have no problem with legal remedies. All yeah. these people who say you shouldn't use the yeah. leaders of. I mean, the reason what you get elected to government is so that you get your hands on the leaders of power and you pull them. And yes, you do have to pay yeah. attention to if you're going to try to use the lever to punish your opponents, be very careful because that's the classic case of in a democracy, there is no such thing. What goes around comes what around. What goes around yeah. comes around and you could have this used on you, absolutely. But a yeah. facially neutral piece of legislation that can be applied to anyone who plays this game, I have no problem with that at all. <laughs> now, I'm a lawyer. I mean, so. law is a tool. This is the, the this is the great insight of Herbert Hart, the, the British, the sort of the leader of the Brit, of British positivists, Herbert Hart and, and Joseph Raz, both of whom well, Herbert Hart was actually the principal of my college at Oxford at Brasenose, and the, his thing was law isn't just you know force backed by a sovereign; it's also a tool. It helps you to do things, and people need to remember that law is this tool that allows you to do things. You know, being able to draft a, a will is a power, and the law gives that to you. And it's private law, uh, and so is seeking, and a, so remedy is seeking in, a remedy in, 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 in tort. Tort. You know, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. that, you know, it, the law facilitates as much as it commands. The law is sovereign command, which tends to be the way natural lawyers over oversimplify the positivist tradition. It's only a tiny, tiny part of what the law can do. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of coming up with legal remedies. I thoroughly approve of the campaign in the UK that got the Academic Freedom Bill through both Houses of Parliament. It's now uh, received royal assent and it's already working. The Oxford University Student Union tried to make life difficult for the Oxford Union. That's the debating society. It's one of the student societies for inviting, guess who, Kathleen Stock, to come and give a talk. <laughs> And or participate in the debate. I'm not sure Oxford. I used to be in the Oxford Union. They do they do debates, but they do talks and they do all sorts of other things. And I remember one of the buildings that the Oxford Conservative Association used to have their port and policy nights, and there was not much policy, but there was an awful lot of port. There's a lot of port <laughs> <laughs> when I was a student there. And basically, the the student union, which was dominated by all these weird lefties, you know, was saying we will disaffiliate. The Oxford Union, which meant they don't can't have a stall at Freshers' Fair, which is when they make most of their money because people sign up and pay the pay the membership, which is quite expensive. I remember when I was there, it was like one hundred and fifty quid or something. It was it's probably more now, inflation. And then suddenly, the whole student union just went flip because that legislation had been passed, and it was oh crap, they can litigate because the academic freedom legislation was in place, and it provides remedies in taught in England and Wales and delict in Scotland. <laughs> and lawsuits are sometimes the answer. Look, one of the reasons why in your country the trans disaster, medical disaster, hasn't been stopped quicker and is going to take a long time to stop was all your silly people who wanted tort law reform with juries handing out millions upon millions to people who for medical negligence cases. 
I was always on the opposite side of all the libertarians who wanted tort law reform. I was sitting there going, no, massive damages payouts exist to keep the medical profession from turning into Mengele. And people thought that I was just being up myself as a lawyer, you know. Oh, you're just fighting with your si- my sister's a doctor. So <laughs> you're just you're just having an argument with your yeah. sister because she's a doctor and you're a lawyer. And no, no, I actually think massive damages payouts that bankrupt companies are there for a good reason. They are to scare seven bells of whatnot out of you so that you don't do something completely bizarre, like give a six yeah. give a sixteen year old a double elective mastectomy. <laughs> but we are headed back in the opposite direction, I think. Uh, finally, after all this time. Uh, precisely because more and more people are seeing the necessity of me- it being easier to mm. sue. And in the absence of that, there's no constraint. Mm. So Laura, I think you know, imagine this, those old yeah. images that you see from those American films with the, the guy pulling on the railway brake. That's what the law yeah. is there for. That's what we're supposed to do. And, <laughs> and though it takes time, we're swinging back in the opposite direction. But I think this this is a good place yep, to stop. It is. We've had, had a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Chat. Yep. Uh, thank you for joining me. Helen Dale's books can be found anywhere you purchase books. Go out and buy Kingdom of the Wicked and The Hand That Signed the Paper and learn for yourself all of the interesting exercises and sympathy she's engaged yep. in. You can follow her on Twitter uh, at, at Helen was it, at underscore Dale. Underscore Helen Dale. Uh, there is, there is a graphic go. designer in Yorkshire who got at Helen Dale ahead of me. So I had to have an underscore. And I've been on Twitter since September 2013. I was the last solicitor. I was in practice still then. I was the last solicitor at my firm to sign up to Twitter. I thought the whole thing was a giant exercise in triviality and nonsense. And I eventually, I don't know that I was exactly told by the managing partner that everybody else in the firm is on Twitter and you have to be as well. But it was very, very close to that. (laughs) And so on that, uh, follow her and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk. Be sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts.